as always, we love to talk college baseball on this show. And certainly our next uh, trip is to Chapel Hill. Bubba, a good friend of mine and uh, my Raleigh radio days. And uh, still, he's still kicking it after all these years uh, in Chapel Hill. Yeah, continuing on with our NCD1 baseball preview. Very excited right now to be joined by the ninth year play-by-play voice of the North Carolina Tar Heels, Dave Nathan. Dave, welcome back. Guys, it's good to be here. I think the last time we did this, most of us couldn't tell you what a Zoom meeting was. And that's exactly right. Uh, the, there's a Zoom recorders we knew about, Dave, uh, being in the radio business, but not as far as a Zoom meeting is concerned, two different okay. companies with the same name. So now I know about both companies and uh, definitely it makes it a lot easier when you can do uh, interviews in, in your living room and, and not like on the in the field as we've had to do so many press conferences. It's kind of we're getting kind of lazy and uh, definitely gained a lot of weight in the process over the last year. Well, you guys are looking good. I'm looking forward to the conversation. No doubt. Let's talk uh, Tar Heel baseball. Very excited to have you back on the show. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, you guys have uh, a new era as far as a new coach uh, hired in August 7th with Coach Forbes. Uh, how is that working out in Chapel Hill so far? Well, your guess is as good as mine right now. Things have been pretty well locked down around the baseball program, and I haven't had a chance to to physically see the team yet play in, in any of their scrimmages. But I know this, Coach Forbes is the if, – if there is a perfect person to succeed Coach Fox, it's got to be Coach Forbes. Uh, the, the two have been together at North Carolina Wesleyan where Coach Forbes played for Coach Fox. Coach Forbes has been Coach Fox's right-hand man for longer than I could probably remember. And in doing so, he's really had a responsibility of handling almost every facet of the program from not just as a pitching coach or an assistant coach, but handling scholarships, helping out with schedules, doing a lot of the day-to-day things that you're responsible for that nobody else sees. So from the baseball side of things, I certainly think that this is a smooth transition. The kids know Coach Forbes. The folks around the program have, have known him for a long, long time. He's got the the trust, I think, of everybody. And again, you, it's it's so tough to see the end of any era, especially one as as great as Coach Fox's was. But if you're looking for the next step and what comes next, I, I don't think there could have been any other way to go than except with Coach Forbes. Yeah, you talk about that, Dave. Um, this was the obvious transition. This is what most folks um, saw coming for quite some time. Whenever Coach Fox did ultimately decide to step away. And with Coach Forbes, and you talk about him taking on those variety of roles, and that's something that I was thinking about several years ago when he moved away from being the pitching coach and uh, Robert Woodard came on board, who's obviously now the head coach at Charlotte, entering his second season with the 49ers. No question. I mean, it's, uh, it's a long lineage of Carolina folks really all around the state. We've got another one back with us this year in, in Coach Howell. And I'm just guessing from Coach Forbes' perspective, the biggest adjustment to to becoming the head coach in addition to getting used to that nice new office that he's got as you walk into the facility is all the stuff that nobody else really sees. I mean, he's got to handle me for a couple hours a week doing a coach's show. Nobody else is really responsible for that. There, there's things that a head coach has to do far and away outside of just showing up for baseball games. And to me, that would be the biggest adjustment. But again, he's, he's watched Coach Fox do it for the better part of 20 years. And although you've never really done it until you're sitting in that seat, he's got to be as, as well adjusted as anybody. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, um, you know, before we dive into this year's club, um, take us back to last season. Um, I know the Tar Heels, I think they had started 12 and 7 and um, had been swept by Notre Dame, uh, Link Jarrett's club there. I want to say that series was in Chapel Hill. But um, just talk about what's returning and the the common theme around the country with all the eligibility rules, also the draft being just five rounds. So many um, teams are much deeper than ever before, and the college baseball product on the whole should be a tremendous one this year. So just talk about how the Tar Heels have handled the, the COVID situation and what the roster looks like on the whole before we dive into specifics. Well, the roster, I think most of us probably need to wear name tags right now because there are very, very few familiar names and faces from really just a couple of years ago to where we are right now. Uh, There's Dallas Tesser, who seems like he came to school as a sixth-year senior. He's the first sixth-year senior in the history of the program. And despite all that experience, given the talent that Carolina's got in the program this year, I don't know if that equals a starting spot 
for Dallas in the lineup or not. But I do know this, Dallas is as good of a clubhouse guy and as much of a winner as I've come across in, in my almost 10 years covering the program. So whatever needs to be done, Dallas will be able to do it, given the spot where, where he holds right now is kind of the elder statesman. Aside from him, um, Angel Zarate was hitting better than 400 last year and I think led the ACC in hits before the season came to an end. There's a spot in the outfield, I think, for Angel right now. There's a newcomer named Justice Thompson, who's a sophomore from Tampa, still celebrating, I think, the Buccaneers Super Bowl win from a few days back. Uh, from what I've heard, he's got some great range. Physically, he looks the part. We'll see what he's able to do at the plate. But I think that might be a name that creeps up on some folks here as the season wears on. And then there's Caleb Roberts, who was a freshman a few years back. Could have played catcher. I think right field is going to be the spot where Caleb works into uh, for the remainder of his career at Carolina. So you do have some familiar names and faces in the outfield. Uh, Infield-wise, I think there's a lot up for grabs from first to third to second base. Danny Ceretti, who was a freshman All-America a couple of years back, has nailed down that shortstop spot. So, again, that's, that's one familiar name and face, at least from that perspective. Behind the plate, uh, it could be any one of a couple of different guys that really haven't played baseball for Carolina, at least much before. And then in the rotation, you've got Joey Lancelotti, who's who's back again. He's been a closer. He's been a long relief guy. I expect him to be the Friday starter when things uh, get off and running here in uh, another week or so. Austin Love, again, who spent a lot of the time of his Carolina career coming out of the bullpen, I think will be moved into the starting rotation. And then you've got some younger players and Will Sandy, who was a freshman a couple of years ago, Max Alba, who played a little bit last year, and Max Carlson duking it out for that third spot on Sunday. And, of course, the odd man out probably works his way into the midweek rotation. And, again, check your schedules. There won't be that many midweek games this year. So for young pitchers, it'll be tough to really get a foothold this year, given how the schedule is structured, the number of league games and series that you play in the weekend and the, the paucity of, uh, midweek games that you get. Dave, as far as uh, the, the roster is concerned, I know one of the blessing in disguise, it may be good or bad, depending on the situation for each club for UNC uh, with the, having guys being able to come back. I know you said that there's a lot of different faces to that. I guess that didn't fit, uh, hurt Carolina as much uh, as far as wondering what guys, okay, you can't come back or you can come back or how did that all play out back in a year ago? That's, that's a great question. You know, the best of my ability, everybody's been given a free year, essentially, which is why you get a guy like Dallas Tesser back for a, a sixth year. So essentially, whatever your class was last year, that's what you are this year. So if you were a freshman last year in 2020, you're a freshman again in 2021. So again, I guess there is um, a, a little bit of kinship, at least between the guys that played almost 20 games last year and, and the folks moving ahead to this year. Um, but given all that, there's still going to be, I think, a pretty good infusion of talent and some players that haven't played that really find their way into the lineup every day this year. And David, where uh, you're talking about the, the roster, the one good thing I think for baseball fans across the state and the nation, it's going to be great to see. I, I just have a feeling maybe I'm the guy that's uh, half full, a uh, glass half full, but I really believe there's going to be a lot of great college baseball, this particular case with Carolina. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. I'd like to believe the best gauge of what's going to happen is taking a look back at history and seeing what's already happened. And uh, Carolina, we were talking about this before we turned the cameras on, has, has been to the College World Series uh, more times than we can probably count. North Carolina State has, has been there inside of the last 10 years. Uh, Coach Walter, Coach Pollard at Wake Forest and Duke have put competitive products out there on the field. Feels like Duke's been knocking on the door to get to Omaha here in, in the last several seasons. And then East Carolina might have as, as good a baseball history as, as anybody having not been uh, to Omaha around these parts. And then you throw in your UNCWs and, and your other schools. You know, we know full and well what Davidson's program is capable of. So, yeah, from the mountains to the coast and everywhere in between, we are really blessed here in this area, North Carolina, to either root for a great team, to see great competition, or just to enjoy it from afar. There's there's a lot going right with college baseball around this part. As far as uh, pitching is concerned, uh, it seems like you think about all the, the greats Carolina's had. That's why they've made it to, uh, you were talking about Omaha. That's how you, I, I think that's the biggest reason you get to Omaha. You need the arms 
uh, as far as pitching is concerned. I know I'm a pitching nerd. How are the uh, pitchers looking this year? Well, if there's been one thing that Carolina has been able to count on, I think year in and year out, it's been what they've had in the rotation. And you're right about that. You get to Omaha with a deep staff, and I truly believe you win at Omaha with a deep staff, given the way that that new ballpark plays. Um, to go back to what the rotation at least could look like, you've got a couple of converted relievers that will possibly be your Friday, Saturday starters with Joey Lancelotti, who, you know, you see him pitch. He just looks like a bull in the China shop. He's got great stuff. Uh, he's from Pennsylvania. Carolina's really worked that Northeastern corridor with a lot of success over the course of time. And he feels like the next one in line that could be a, a real big time player. And one of the attributes that I think Joey brings that Carolina really hadn't had a lot of in the past is that he could very easily be a two-way player. You can hit him in the lineup, you can throw him on Friday, and he can produce in a number of different ways. So he's a really unique player in, in terms of what Carolina really hasn't had. And then there's Austin Love, who's been that long reliever, closer type pitcher in his career at Carolina. Really consistent, really good stuff. And Saturday seems like it's the spot for him before you get to Sunday. Uh, Max Carlson, somebody I haven't seen pitch yet, but talking with some folks around the program, doesn't throw it all that hard, somewhere between 89, 92. But when you start hearing names like he reminds us of Zach Gallon, your ears kind of perk up, given how important Zach was to the program and how much success he had at AAA before he got the call up to the bigs and how consistent he's been in such a short time in the major league. So you take note when people start saying, he reminds me of Zach Gallon. And then there's Max Alba, who, who came to Carolina with all sorts of upside. We'll see if, if there's a spot for him in the weekend rotation. And then Will Sandy, who was super impressive to me as a, a freshman a couple of years back when Carolina really didn't have very many lefties. He was one that they could count on. He nailed down the Sunday spot back in 2019 for roughly the second half of the season. And I thought was relatively consistent with a couple of extra years under his belt right now knowing the league, maturing, and understanding the game a little bit more. I'm really curious to see if, if he fights into that Sunday spot or if he might be a midweek guy. If not, again, he could be a long relief pitcher. So, again, Carolina's certainly got their options. That's not anything that's changed. And to have a guy like Bryant Gaines, who pitched at Carolina during his career, was an assistant, worked his way over to Liberty where he worked with Coach Jackson, a former Carolina assistant, and has now come back to Carolina as the pitching coach. I mean, again, you, you trust your, your assistants, as I know that Coach Forbes does, and uh, Coach Gaines has, uh, you know, despite the fact that he's not as long in the tooth as some others out there, he's got a lot of experience in a short amount of time. They you referenced him, the scheduling issues and with the pandemic as far as not playing as many midweek games. Just talk about the Tar Heel schedule on the whole. Um, how the ACC is handling things in terms of number of series and um, any, any type of adjustments uh, and then touch on who the Tar Heels play out of conference. Yeah, well, it starts early for Carolina uh, and, and it's going to be a tough go over against Kentucky. That's the opening series of the season for the Tar Heels and that'll be on the 19th, the 20th and the 21st of February. So you start out right out of the gate with an SEC team uh, that I'm sure will be more than competitive coming to Chapel Hill and if you're looking for measuring sticks, I suppose you could know very early on going into ACC play, which is the very next week, I think, against Virginia, uh, where Carolina stands. Uh, the road schedule, again, only looking at you guys and just not looking at the schedule, it's, it's kind of daunting given where Carolina has to go. You've, you've got a trip to Florida State. You've got to go up to Boston College. Pittsburgh shows up on the schedule. So you've got some pretty lengthy road trips and then teams coming to play Carolina. Uh, again, I think Clemson uh, comes up on the schedule, Miami. Of course, there's Duke, there's State, there's, there's all the usual suspects. So there'll be a handful fewer games this year overall. There'll be several more ACC games, which translates into more ACC series. You see virtually everybody in the league this year, as opposed to playing just 30 games. I think it'll wind up closer to, to 36 this year with the Atlantic Coast Conference. And again, as we all know, schedules can certainly change on a dime, uh, given what we've seen in football and basketball this year. I got no reason to think that baseball is going to be any different than that. Uh, but you'll play a much more competitive schedule given the number of league games you'll play. There won't be as many, if any, 
Tuesday, Wednesday, midweek games. So maybe you only get one midweek game per week to, to work some things out. And there could be some long stretches from, you know, Wednesday, Thursday into Friday, Saturday, Sunday before you get back on the field. So it'll be different. But again, that's why they call these people coaches to get these kids ready and, and to put them in a position to succeed. And we've clearly seen in all the other sports right now, uh, some folks have been very adept at getting this figured out and really hadn't missed a beat. Dave, that's uh, that's the one thing that I'm worried about uh, with the cancellation. I know East Carolina played like 17 games, and then it's, the season's gone. That's my number one thing. That I think. Players, uh, not for the fans, really, because I do feel bad for the fans, but not not as much as the the coaches and, and players, but. Um, just curious to see how many games we can get in this year. And uh, hopefully that by the time uh, that we're looking at the summertime when uh, June rolls around and uh, May and June, the numbers will keep going down for COVID-19. And we want to see a lot of these start, start stoppages we've seen for football and basketball. Yeah, absolutely. And again, just using some of the other sports as a guide, I thought the ACC did a phenomenal job in getting its football games played this year I think it was something close to 97 or 98 percent of the games that were scheduled got played and you guys know this even in a good year when you've got things like hurricanes and other postponements that come about you're not going to get in all your games even when you're not living in a global pandemic so you take your hat off to how the ACC got things done and who do you credit for that well the kids the staffs the administration and the overall leadership that that put them in a spot to get these things done with basketball, yeah, there have been some hiccups along the way, but by and large, you know, we're almost roughly a year removed from a starting point. And to think that we're a month away or so from starting an NCAA tournament, hopefully, and having conference championships again and playing as many games as we've had, I think the odds are in our favor right now to play close to a full baseball season. Are we going to play 100% of the games? Probably not realistic in any year with rain delays and, and other issues that can come up, but. If, if we can creep up much past 44, 45 games and, and have uh, essentially a full season before you get into the conference tournament and before you get into the NCAA tournament, you just have to, again, credit all the folks that make this possible. As, as folks on the outside, whether in the media or whether we're fans, we're, we're ancillary compared to how everybody on the inside has been essentially forced to live their lives in order to get these seasons in. It's It's been... <laughs> A heck of a difference, I can tell you from hearing some of the stories. And one of these days, somebody will write a book on it. No doubt. Hey, uh, as far as Dave, as far as uh, have you heard anything as far as UNC, as far as maybe when the uh, kids, uh, the players, coaches will get, uh, I think it would be in the springtime, they would get their shots. I really don't know. I, all I know is I think that I heard that Coach Williams was able to get in line to get his on the basketball front uh, a couple of weeks back, but I really couldn't tell you anything about anybody getting vaccinated. That's going to be really interesting. Hopefully we can get that done. As far as uh, how can people find your work, I appreciate you coming on. Been a good friend for a long time, but it's hard to believe I think a decade now I've known you and uh, do a great job. I can't wait to hear you this uh, this season. How can people hear your work uh, as far as uh, uh, Tar Heel baseball? Sure. They can uh, go to GoHeels.com or get the app. We, we stream, I think, every one of our games this year. If you're local inside the Triangle area, WCHL is, is one of our yeah. affiliates. WBAG in Burlington is, is another way that you can find us. And, uh, again, 10 years, Dave, you're taking me back in time, my man. It's been a while. Friendship. Appreciate listening to you. Do a great job on the call and look forward to it. Hopefully you guys will have a great season and uh, – definitely get back to Omaha. Well, that's, uh, that's certainly the hope. That's a lot of people's expectation. But uh, if we get there, we certainly know that we'll have earned it. And, and if we are there, I expect to see you two there in person. And maybe we can do this face-to-face -face for a change instead of over the internet. That would be awesome. I can't wait. Hopefully we can uh, have, that would be awesome if we could have fans uh, in Omaha this year, my friend. But uh, certainly at some point, the two schools will make it at the same time. And I know we've got a trip uh, coming up. Uh, or you guys do. I know we've got, we're going to be playing uh, here pretty soon. So we'll definitely have you back on. All right, guys, looking forward to it. Always appreciate it.